Hello, good Come to up front. Now we're just a week to the final funeral rites of perhaps the greatest Ghanaian to have ever lived after Saji Fo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Today on Upfront, we will eulogize and put the, into proper perspective the legacy of Busumu Kofi Annan. This and many more issues are the ones going to be at the center of our conversation with another great man with extraordinary competence in international affairs. After the break, I'll introduce my guest and we commence our conversation here on Upfront. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. Next week, Thursday, September 13, the world will congregate here in Ghana to pay their last respect to Kofi Annan, who was arguably the most consequential United Nations Secretary General since the second Doug Hamill shot. I'm sure you would know him. Of course, unlike the Danish Swedish um, uh, diplomat, Annan was an organization man. Fact, first to rise through the ranks of the UN and, and helping to go through to the highest position. And yet he used his knowledge of the UN system to good effect in this particular case, as many have said, becoming an eloquent advocate for virtually what was supposed to be a flawed organization, embodying the conscience of what some hopefully call the international community at some point in time. I did tell you that my guest today is a man who typifies the competence of a UN system that's supposed to work well. He has a proper and appreciable understanding of it, and he actually is a man of many parts. But recently, he's in charge of academic affairs at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Dr. Vlad Menchid, I see you're welcome. Thank you very much. I hope you're doing well today. Well, very well. By it, the it's been a God. very long time since we had an encounter, that's and, and uh, it should be often, I mean, so that... Well, that much could... depends on you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, <coughs> the legacy has been talked about in several forms. Others think that he arrived from when he was head of peace uh, keeping okay. and mindful of what happened in the genocide Rwanda. case in Rwanda and all of that. He started a job with a lot of pessimism about whether or not he could do it, yeah. but he proved people wrong. That's right. But from where you said, do you think, and as I described me first, indeed he left those footprints that are indelible footprints that cannot be erased anytime soon. Absolutely. Um, uh, let me say very good evening to your viewers, cherished viewers. Uh, Kofi Annan represents what all of us have always wished for, for the United Nations, in the sense that he really understood the dynamics within the uh, United Nations system okay. and what the United Nations uh, itself uh, stood for and should stand for. And so it would be very difficult to obliterate immediately uh, what he did from the memory of those of us who have been researchers in the field. In the sense that we all know that the United Nations was built uh, on a state-centric kind of system. Yeah. Uh, even though the preamble talked about <coughs> we, the, the peoples, people. yeah. uh, nation states have been the primary actors within the UN system. Uh -huh. On and on, Kofi Annan realized that the um, superstructure that is the United Nations has been superimposed on a current structure and the discord is clearly there. Mm -hmm. And so he sought in several ways, having been within the system for a long time, uh, to change and make the UN more responsive and res re responsible for what is happening. If, if you watch out, you see states are no longer the most serious actors on mm -hmm. the international stage. Yeah. Non-state actors have become more active, and the uptick of non-activism of non-state actors clearly showed that we need to change. We need to redefine security. So Kofi Annan, a, a liberal as he, he is, or he was, uh, realized that even though the UN system was premised on the realist kind of thinking, uh, where security is the most important, and national security means that piling of arms and antagonizing your enemy, knowing enemy, uh, it's an us versus them kind of syndrome, mm -hmm. he wanted to change that thing to a, a, a concern which is an international security. What okay. we mean when, when we talk of security. Mm. And that was how he set up, for example, the 16 member uh, committee, yeah. uh, commission, to come out with a redefinition of security. So if you watch out, the as that aspect of uh, human security we begin to talk about was even changed. It included our own marriage, uh, Chirin Hesse, when they yeah. came out with a complete redefinition of security to include <coughs> your personal security, hunger, 
thirst, all those kinds of things that will make a human being live is the security. If that is the case, then there is no difference between a German and an American and a Ghanaian. So let us have that kind, kind of concern. So he brought about a lot of innovation, and that will also depend on changing the very structure of the United Nations. That's the Security Council and all the other structures that yeah. make for security. He didn't succeed much. Yeah, that's what I was coming to, because <laughs> it looked like the very ambitious changes exactly. he thought to make, especially to the Security Council, did not work out. Exactly. It, did not work. it did not work. I'll come to that very soon. But at least what worked out was the general concern about humanity. Okay. The Millennium Development Goals. Uh -huh. Now we have sustainable development. We are all thinking about humanity, the, the concept of the planet belonging to all, and therefore the sustain, sustenance of it is as important as anything. He succeeded in that. Everybody just believes that we have only one F, and therefore we must work towards it in the liberal sense. But most importantly, he said, we need a structure, a vehicle to, to, to make that work better. And that's why he wanted to change the Security Council and what all that happened. Because when we have all agreed on the betterment of humanity, okay. and one country says no, that is the end. <laughs> His maybe mistake was what all of us know is the mistake of the United Nations structure itself. The P5. Okay. So it's a catch-22 situation. Whatever you want to do with the UN, you've got to go back to the P5. Whatever you want to do, whether you want to even kill it, you've got to go back to the P5 and say, can I kill it? Okay, so to those so, who do not know the P5. The P5 is the permanent five. That is, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, the, it's structured in such a way that the, those victors in the Great War mm -hmm. were made to have some veto power. That is, mm -hmm. if all the world said, yes to something, and they believe one country, like Russia, the, the P5 is made up of uh, the US, Russia, China, France, and Britain. Yeah. These five countries could say no to everything that all the 193 countries have said yes. But that is, that it was made in order to sustain some kind, some kind of balance. But Kofi Annan saw that it has outlived its usefulness. So can we make a restructure it? And he threw it out. He didn't say that this is my position. He threw it out. Africa went with their own position, called the Izulwini Consensus. Yeah. And in that consensus, Africa was asking for two positions on the Security Council. They were asking for a rotatory system. And Kofi Annan put all these things together and brought it out to the United Nations in his book called In Larger Freedom. Yeah. Now, he took a parody from the, from the preamble, where the preamble is saying that we must do everything so that succeeding generations will live in larger freedom. You know, so he did something at least for the world to have a, a thinking about. He set the stage. It's up to us. He's, he's done a lot for the United Nations. And you don't think I was way too ambitious, especially mindful of the history of the UN itself? Well, ambitions are always very good. Mm -hmm. There was no way any other person could have brought all that Kofi Annan brought, mm -hmm. but only through the way he did. You remember, Boutros Jasgali was thinking about security in a different terms, so yeah. the, the agenda for peace. So he was thinking of um, world peace through peace itself, all right? But Kofi Annan was thinking about world peace through development and consensus, yeah. that we all believe that this is good. Let's go for it. And so what he has set in stage has set minds going that, hey, look, this is good. Let's go for it. Unfortunately, the UN members, member uh, states themselves are the killers of the UN and not people like Kofi Annan. Because you remember Bolton, who is now the advisor to Trump, yeah. was the very representative, permanent representative of the U.S. in the U.N. at the time. And he brought Kofi Annan 700 questions <laughs> on what Kofi Annan wanted to, to, to do. So look, if you can answer these questions, it's like you're trying to throw away sovereignty. You're trying to throw away uh, a nation's right to decide, kind of. Dissolving. Dissolving, the, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, well, the Americans didn't allow it to flow. But a lot of, about 80 to 90 percent of what Kofiana wanted to do, he did. And let me, let, me, let me be quick in saying that he's about the one and only um, UN Secretary General who, who, who was able to understand the dynamics of the UN. He was bold. There's no other person who has been more bold. For example, going to Iraq, he used his good offices to ensure that what happened in Iraq didn't happen. But the Americans were bent on going in 2003. Yeah. And he was even there more bold to tell the Americans that this was illegal. And he was subjected to all kinds of...
you know, manipulation. But was this not uh, problematic? Mindful of the fact that some have postulated, in fact, his coming into office was also because the Americans did not want Butoas Butoas in the first place. That's fine. So to depart from those who probably put you there uh, seemed to have been a problem right from the beginning. That is a plus rather to show that mm -hmm. the man wanted to be independent. And he was standing for the United Nations. That's the many in the world, not for one country. The fact that you put me there, and I believe that if all of us would emulate, if you brought me to the studio, and because you brought me to the studio, you wanted me to pander to your whims, uh, and, and I did, then I'm no person, you understand? But Kofi Annan's too tall. He understood international law. Yeah. And he understood that that's not the way to go. That unilateralism was not part of the dictionary of the United Nations. And therefore, we need to have a multilateralist approach to solving global problems. And that was what he was insisting on. Let me talk about legacy because probably that's where the contention should be. Yes. The man is no more living. He yeah. had a foundation officer. Let's start from the local of here in Ghana. Of course, we put together a very fine funeral. But beyond that, what should we do to cement this particular reputation that's put us on the world map for a very long time? I think uh, until his death, uh, we all knew him to be just not a Ghanaian one way. Yeah, it's like in the minds of Ghanaians, yeah. there is a Ghanaian somewhere yeah. who is not a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. uh, we honored him with the title Busumuru and that kind of thing. We need to continue eulogizing and immortalizing the name. Uh, I strongly suspect that textbooks that are going to be written and things like that should continue to let people know that this is what he stood for. Secondly, I strongly suspect that there was a lot that Kofi Annan may have said, may have done, which we need to emulate. Kofi Annan is a democrat personal, mm. and he hated non-peace. So if you watch that, he traveled to several places, several places to ensure that there was peace. Can we, therefore, not start any untoward things that will bring non-peace into this country? Okay. It's very, very important that Kofi Annan, you, you know, the whole structure of the man, and when you meet the person, you see that it is an embodiment of peace itself. I mean... I mean, his demeanor. Very calm. Can we, can we have government officials, journalists, whatever, whatever, emulating the Kofi Annan we know so that we inculcate into our youth the essence of peace generally? These are some of the things, okay, yes, naming streets and whatnots after him and that kind of thing. It's okay. But Ghanaians... Well, Entrudanso Street and so what? They wouldn't even bother to know who they entered Entrudanso. Well, how about monuments, huge That's what I'm ones? Mo in this yes, case. huge monuments, streets, etc., etc. Would one day, you know, remind people that oh, this man we were told was the Secretary General of the United. Go round the streets and find out what the UN stands for at all. Okay, yeah, and yeah. you'd be surprised yeah. what the answers would be. Interesting. So we could go through Kofi Annan to at mm -hmm. least and instill the UN in every single person uh, across the globe and especially in Ghana. The, the question, and I'm going to run into a couple of the proposals that have come up. So I've said that the airport, the Kotuka International Airport, our most important airport cannot be consistently named after somebody who participated in a legal overthrow of a president of the republic. Some have suggested that. Others are saying that we can put to rest whether or not to rename the University of Ghana by giving it to Kofi Annan in the first place. These options have been put on the table. Where would you want to support? Well, that's if any of them tickles your fancy. In well, it, it tickles my fancy only if we can change the name Kotoka. That one I agree with any other person. I see. Who would say that Kotoka's name uh, is, 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 is an insult to the sensibilities of uh, most Ghanaians because it ushered it as into uh, some negativities in the yeah. country, yes. Uh, it's divisive mm -hmm. where you begin to talk about this, but obviously, yes, uh, uh, the Kotoka International Airport, the name is really divisive where Ghana okay. stands. So if we want to name it after Kofi Annan, I wouldn't have any, any problem with that. But that again will, will start some kind of uh, problematic issues. But whether we like it or not, we must immortalize the name. Okay. So I wouldn't mind if I hear we want to build a new airport. Why not? Uh, can't we... Can't we actually name a new airport after Kofi Annan, for example? Okay. If it is the old airport, this very airport after Kofi Annan, I do not think the world will be against, and Ghanaians should not be against also. And mm. again, Kofi Annan would have been uh, the person who takes away that dichotomy, that, that antagonistic kind of feeling towards Kotoka International Airport. Interesting. There's a question that's related to all of this. I mean, looking at the history of this country, looking at the kind of people we have in the country now, can we in the nearest future... Raise another Kofi Annan. 
Do what? Raise another Kofi Annan. Well, well, well. Um, heroes come at various points in mm -hmm. the history of a country. Mm -hmm. And I believe there will come a time when another Kofi Annan can come. But we're trying to raise a Kofi Annan like from a poultry farm. Yes. Uh, it's not possible in any country. Really? No, absolutely. I mean, we, can, we can encourage by creating the platforms for a Kofi Annans to be made. Mm -hmm. But not rearing them like poultry farm chicks for one of them to be a Kofi Some Annan. Some say because we couldn't do the same with Nkrumah and Co. That's why we are where we are today and that we should be deliberate about some of these things. Yes, most countries are very deliberate. In mm -hmm. fact, both the Americans and the Russians, I knew that the Russians had what they call a scientific city, yeah. where very brilliant ch uh, children at age five are even taken away from their parents mm -hmm. and taken to the scientific city and that kind of thing. So they are bound to be scientists, oh, okay. the way they, they rear them. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that you can rear them that way, but it depends on the individual, his, his upbringing, his demeanor, and everything. Uh, my study of Kofiana, for example, makes me behave in some other ways, mm -hmm. all right? So may I train my children and whatnot. But if the system itself creates the condition for people to come up, and I tell you there are a lot of Ghanaians who are doing very well out there. There are two Ghanaians uh, with all of this, and I think one died uh, some few years back, working with NASA, North American uh, Space Agency. Okay. And, and, and people didn't think they were Ghanaians because mm. they are super scientists, all right? So such situations, depended on how the people were built and the atmosphere given to them. And I'm told they were both from Ghana National College. Yeah. Nkrumah set it up as a special place to breed such scientists. Can we continue that way to make some special schools and help them come up? Then their own inner uh, virtues, all right? Inbuilt, inherent virtues, God-given kind of uh, 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 intellect would raise them to become the Kofi Annans because it's not easy just to whisk yourself up and become uh, Kofi Annan, uh, absolutely. It's interesting. And this question I should get you to answer. Is our current education system in the position, in the standards and quality to produce the kind of people that we are talking about in this case? We are lacking behind in a whole lot of things. I've always said that government's interference in most of the things that should be open to technocrats yeah. is, is very debilitating. Mm -hmm. You see, elsewhere, we are teachers. Elsewhere and everywhere, the emphasis is no longer on teaching. Mm -hmm. Emphasis is on learning. Are we creating the enabling environment for people to learn? What we're doing is more of rote memory kind of learning. So the teacher comes, teaches, the student chews, pours them back to the professor or the teacher, and then <laughs> you mark 70% A, and the person goes away. Goes through the university, but the university doesn't go through the person. So okay. he's learned the thing in a road kind of way. When you produce such people in 21st century Africa, 21st century world, uh, you are not going to produce those kind of persons that will rise to become the Kofianans. I'll leave off education, but there's another interesting development on the front of international relations that's particularly interesting because Ghana's elite diplomats, including the president of the Republic of Ghana, right. earlier this week were in China. Right. Uh, the president was treated to his favorite song right. and we actually went to cement an arrangement for $2 right. billion. Beyond the $2 billion, though, the president made an announcement that was pretty much interesting. $50 billion century born in the right. orphan. Right. Ghana's relationship with China, it looks like it's taking a different trend, newfound love. That's right. Recently, we thought there was some friction because of Galamsey and the quest to fight same. Right. Right. But it doesn't look like that has been affected in any way. Yeah. First and foremost, should we be worried about China's, and I mean, the New York Times calls it invasion, of Africa? I think those who should be worried are those who have some geopolitical kind of thinking. The Americans are worried. Mm -hmm. They are worried because China is, is overtaking Africa. And rightly so, because what they are doing is what manufacturing offshoring, foreign direct offshoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, um, the Chinese have done much for Africa, if you look at the figures. In fact, They've outstripped. The, the, the trade volumes are huge. Very huge. They looks like over 200 billion mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. last year. All mm -hmm. right. And then their FDI to Africa is rising and rising. And in fact, FDI to Africa. I have some level figures. Uh, uh, if if I could refer to them, right. In fact, more than 40 percent of China's. Uh, uh, no, no, not even that. Let me let me go to straight away to the amount of this thing. The uh, sectors, for example, in Africa, or let's say even the general uh, um, uh, investment in Africa. Uh, 
they, they take over more than 20% of investment generally. Okay. Can you imagine? This is not even the government. It's actually institutions. Yes. It's private like, business. So if you take the rest of the world, mm -hmm. it's taking the 80%. Okay. And if they are taking over more than 20% in uh, this thing, then, then you could know that they are doing very well for... for and within Sub-Saharan Africa, they take over 40%. I see. 43 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. But let's make it clear. Yes, those were the days when uh, anything uh, Japanese was wrong. Yeah. It's bad. Anything Don't China go to Japan. Fake. Anything China is bad. Why is Trump putting a lot of pressure on China? It's the same geopolitical kind of consideration. China has moved away from this kind of big-time politics. When you say big-time politics or high politics, it's it's military politics. Okay. Yeah. And they are moving towards a kind of economic politics. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, what they have done is to strengthen themselves seriously, both economically and militarily. So they are not concerned about their military side. America is more concerned militarily, looking for bases elsewhere in the world and helping with some patriotisms and assuring people of their security. China doesn't care about that. He cares of how much trade I can have with you how much I can help you to develop, so that I also benefit from that development. And Americans are now seeing it, especially when China has been able to conquer the whole of Africa. My worry, if you ask me, mm -hmm. is that it is not a threat. It becomes a threat the way we are uh, embracing China. Because we are embracing them in the wrong way. Africa is embracing China in the wrong way. That's the point I want to explore with you. Right. When you say we are embracing if, them the wrong way, what does that if, you mean? If the West exploited us to build the, their place, yeah. the Chinese don't have to be allowed to exploit Africa. They have very good things. So I always ask friends in politics, do not go to China. Let Bring China, China to, you. to you. What do I mean? Offshoring manufacturing is the basis for development. So if Nana, uh, the historicalist Nana Rodan Kwekufu Adu, you want to flirt with the Chinese, then we are expecting that Chinese industries mixed with Ghanaian partnership or whatever it is, can create the same atmosphere for production here in Ghana so that we have learning by doing, we have employment, and then it's uh, augments our export base. And transfers technology in and the process. That's what yeah. I'm saying, learning by doing. Yeah. The transferring of the technology. But if it means getting the loans to import things from China, then we have, we have done nothing. Or getting the loan for them to come build it. Come build it, build it. That, or come build it can be, can be allowed one way or mm -hmm. the other. Get the loan, and most grants, you know, yeah. whenever you get those, the, those grants, they won't allow you to. You can't take a grant from me and go and buy from another person, especially yeah. my enemy. So, <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So when they give you the grant, they, they give you some little conditions about the mm -hmm. grant. Japanese gave us some huge amount of uh, millions of yen some time back, about 10, 15 years ago. And they, but they said, take the money, go and buy rice from, from uh, uh, Vietnam. Okay. I, I got mad. I wrote some articles about that, <laughs> saying that, what is this? It means they are giving the money to Vietnam. Yes. But through Ghana. Through Ghana. But through Ghana means that they are lowering the, the rice production. Mm -hmm. I remember Honorable uh, Kari uh, uh, Kwashinga was then the, the uh, Greek minister. A and we met, and I said, look, you know what they are doing? And if you remember, Kwashinga said, no, we'll take it, but then we'll still increase the production of our rice from 15% to 30%. These are some of the subtle ways, if you don't take care of the Chinese, you know, one way or the other, uh, conquer your economy. Again, they are coming in in such that when they know you are loose, that institutions are not serious, they are not working, and the rule of law is there, but it's not working. They can't even negotiate well. Not only the negotiation. They will, they will bypass your laws and be there. If you go to Angola, you'll be sorry. They've virtually taken over the Angolan economy. We people are crying that they are selling uh, meat on the streets. They are there in Angola. Thousands and thousands of them have gotten even Angolan citizenship. I see. Yes, we, we've done some little work on that. I've written some articles about that. So Ghana, we allowed them. Who told you that we didn't have institutions to check the Chinese when they built bridges on our rivers mm -hmm. and were mining right in the, in the belly of the rivers? Were there no institutions the who gave them the license? So if you allow the Chinese to do that, they will do it. You see, when we were accusing them, the government was saying we didn't know anything about it. But now that we know, we, know, we don't support it. That's what the Chinese told us. Yeah. Which means that, excuse me, we were fools.
<laughs> right? So if you allow the Chinese to take over the economy in the negative way, they will do it. But knowing how to deal with the Chinese, you will prosper. Egypt and other countries, let me show you. In the transport sector, in the energy sector, mining sector, communications, and other sectors, they are doing well. They have given employment to, do, to Africa uh, about 38,417 last year, when the Americans are giving only 11,000. Mm. You know, so one way or the other, it's like when you see the, indi the indicators, you UK had given only two thousand. <laughs> when you see, look at the indicators, flirting with the Chinese is a good thing, but how do you flirt with the person? But not to enjoy yourself. Do we have a policy? What's Ghana's policy towards China? Well, Ghana's main foreign policy pillars have not changed over the years. Yes, but do we have a specific one towards the majors of China. The exploitative competence of China in this particular case? No, the point is that I don't think there is any specific uh, law or policy say this is our China policy. Uh, you see those policies from the politicians, from uh, Nana Dedan yes. I was surprised, for example, when uh, His Excellency, uh, former President Kufo, uh, was a member of the FOCAC, that is the Forum on China-Africa uh, 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 Conference. In, 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 and the, another one is going on right now. President Kufo was virtually the leader of the African group that met with the Chinese in 2005. Mm -hmm. And that was where things were cemented. You would, you, would, you would believe that the Chinese would have moved towards uh, leftist governments or leftist parties. The mm -hmm. Chinese don't care. They don't care who is ruling. The ideology doesn't matter. The ideology doesn't matter. Theirs is uh, live a less live kind of thing, which Americans don't want. But uh, some have said that they are also less caring about whether or not a dictator, uh, what they call it, a ruthless person is in charge of the state or not, and that is very worrying to the rest of the world. It was the same worrying situation. That's, I'll come back to this. It was the same worrying situation when uh, Reagan introduced Mobutu to the world, that he's the bastion <laughs> of, of African democracy. I mean, come on, let's... let's, let's That's right. true. <laughs> you know, you know? So now we should learn from those things. Yeah. That... If the Chinese don't care about a dictator and what they are doing props up a dictator, then we should know how to make our democracies more recipient to good uh, uh, assistance so that we build on. But we but just stand and so the Chinese are so, can't we build a kind of insulative kind of uh, measures to ensure that we are not exploited? Can't they benefit from us the way? Because look, the Chinese population is close to about 1.8 billion. Yeah. All right? Africa, we are one billion. They need our market. Europe is about 500 million. America is about 500 million. They need our market. Why aren't we build, building some kind of resilience enough to, to, to ward off any kind of exploitation? Do, we can do that. Do if we have a continent wide approach to this? Or individual yes. countries ought to take this bull by the horn? You see, uh, a system is one which has parts that operate, if the parts are operating. Mm -hmm. So if individual countries are operating and we, we really speed up integration, you see, they exploit you when the parts are not working. Yeah. If ECOWAS is ECOWAS, and ECOWAS has a Chinese policy, for example, you asked me about policy. Mm -hmm. Europe has a Chinese policy. Yeah. It has a, 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 and China has an African policy. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So if they come to Ghana and Ghana is bluffing, oh, Mali says come. Uh, Uganda says come and that, but if we were united, like ECOWAS will have to sign the agreement. And I remember very well, uh, Tony Blair, sometime, sometime back, wanted to deal with the Chinese the way he wanted to deal as the prime minister. Mm -hmm. And he was, excuse me, barking loud, threatening. Then one lady, I think Crawford was the name or so, she used to be the foreign. Uh, affairs secretary or minister for the EU, I mean, European Union, and it's, it's a British woman, can you imagine telling Tony Blair, no, 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 you can't do that. That's mm -hmm. not our policy. It was beautiful. That's that there was an European policy and one country cannot misbehave yeah. in such a way that China does not exploit Europe. That's the beauty of integration. And I believe that, like you were saying, in uni unity lies strength, which yeah. the parts must do their part in such a way that Ghana does not want to be exploited, Senegal doesn't want to be exploited, what, on and on and on. But then in the collective also, the policy says that China cannot exploit one against the other. Now, let me draw down to our current arrangement of $2 billion Sino hydro deal. Yeah. Is this deal, from the outdoor point of it, good in your own eyes? 
everything is good. Snakes are even good in terms of what you... And I'm coming to you because right. of the bauxite concerns bauxite concern, that have been yes, raised yes, about whether yes. or not, at the end of the day, it will is be exploitative. Exploitative, exploitative. Fish raises concerns. Exactly. Other institutions of international repute are raising concerns yes, about yes. this deal. Yes. I was coming to you. I said, anything, everything on this earth is good mm -hmm. to the extent uh, that you make use of it, good use of it. You sign an agreement, a two billion thing. And uh, you 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 saying it's not barter, mm -hmm. which is good, that a Ghanaian company is going to be established to es uh, 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 exploit the um, bauxite, bauxite yeah. and we'll use the proceeds from then to pay the loan. I have no quarrel about that. If indeed this is what is going to happen, now. If it were going directly to the Chinese for exploitation, I know if you give the Chinese one uh, meter, they would take three. And then where the bauxite is going to be mined, environmental concerns, the Chinese are very poor at those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't care, right. if, especially if you don't regulate them and be strict on them. In their own backyard, they do it to their own country. And so this agreement, by what I have seen and read, and by the explanation of the finance minister, I don't see anything wrong with it, except if we shall really go by the letter of what is being done. You don't have the money. to. Ex you have the thing down there. It's not yeah. being exploited. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, I'll give you your money to exploit it. Now, it is not he who is coming to exploit it aside, but it's like it is money. And then proceeds from the firm is going to pay back this. I don't have anything. And, 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 and without asking the World Bank whether it is a loan or barter, yeah. I I'm sad a little about that because, look, it is about time we wind ourselves from the clutches of the IMF. President Gufford did all we, he could and weaned us out. We're out. So if anything, we would uh, just go for advice or that sort of thing. Because the moment you ask the world, uh, IMF especially, to be the policeman of your economy, generally, you, you, you shrink your policy space. And it is because of the shrinking of policy space that most governments, especially the Muhammad administration, was really typically screwed in. Yes, and government has always complained about exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Say, three years, don't uh, uh, employ anybody. But they can't tell the Ghanaian public that the IMF says, I don't have to employ. Mm -hmm. And the unemployment is going on. But it is the IMF because they're, they've given you a program. And you've got to go by the letter of the program. Every minute they are breathing over your neck and say, no, 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 no you are veering off. You, you are veering off. Yeah. So why are we still wanting the IMF to be the antenna of what we want to do? But is that I, it's not basically because when you fail to manage your affairs properly, you actually have to have a supervisor do it for you. That one I agree because the IMF has always been the policeman of developing countries' economies since mm -hmm. it was set up. It's of late when the Soviet Union imploded that the Eastern countries are running to the IMF. Other than that, only four countries had ever asked advice from the IMF from the North mm -hmm. at all. So they have been the police. But most of their thinking have been steeped in liberal postulates which favor the West. And so at points in time, they would even advise you to go for Chinese loans. They would, they would stop you. And if you don't stop, they punish you. So I'm saying, those who are saying, let's take this government to the IMF and ask them whether they could do this or do that, I'm not for that. Oh, okay. I'm not for that because you, it means you are still under the, the, the watchful eyes and the, the screws of the IMF. That you can do this, but you cannot do it. Your policy space shrinks, and it's the people of this country which suffer. Because what will happen is that was, oh, you know, that Chinese loan is bad. Uh, it is a, it's a loan. So you can't do the, buy the things that we have yes. signed with you. Yes. You can't go there. Uh, then we stop there. Because two things will matter. We have a fiscal deficit regime in the targets that yes. we're supposed to meet. meet. Yes. When we call it a loan, it means that it will increase our debt exactly. to GDP and also throw that fiscal target out of coverage. And as soon as, as, soon it, as it, you throw it away, they say, yeah. let's sign a new, let's extend. Very good. Let's, Extension. No, no and we're supposed things. to end this particular IMF deal By this December, year. December, yes. Yes. So I strongly suspect that uh, we need to we need to all help mm -hmm. whichever ever government in power, especially this particular government, which has brought grandeur kinds. At times, I fear the, uh, the what can I use the word gargantuan nature yes. of, of the policy towards mm -hmm. redirecting development. But see what is lacking in our development, and we must be watchful of that. We need that before we can move forward. Is that? The NDPC, the National Development Planning, Planning Commission, Commission yeah. is being made irrelevant in our politics, in our political devel uh, uh, economic development. I have always stood for a, an NDPC which is technocratic in nature. Mm -hmm. Only technocrats. Those who know planning, they are not going to implement. They plan for you. 
For example, they will research and know that we have two million uh, deficit, housing deficit. Mm -hmm. We have 10 million uh, water, potable water deficit, this, this, this. And then they plan that by our economy, we can liquidate, say, 1 million uh, one year, another 2 million in two years. If they plan it such this way, then the political parties will have to go there before they write their manifestos. I see. But we have a situation where, without having any knowledge about the basis of the economy and where we're going, every government comes and say, I am going to give you 50 million housing this year, and they make 3 million. Mm -hmm. And so the other government, the other party say, you see, they couldn't do it. Give it to me. And they say, me, I will make 100 million. They make 1 million. And we keep on changing government just because promises have not been fulfilled. Yes. But if we go through the NDPC, we will know even when the government has not fulfilled it, we will know the reason. The reason being X, Y, Z, which didn't come. The, the postulates that we uh, put. But other than that, the, we're going to have this. Because, because we virtually abandoned the 60 or 40 exactly. year development plan. But they themselves, have, you remember Nemco my article, I got mad. How can you draw such a beautiful plan? And when we were outdooring the plan, they themselves told us that it is not binding. So yeah. why did you do it? They made it look like it was just a broad framework. It was uh, some, just like most of us are researching into something <laughs> which is not useful for anything. <laughs> you know? it, was, it was interesting, and it looks like it's virtually dead now. Virtually dead. Virtually the work of the NDP is being done by the Ministry of Planning exactly. today. Exactly. But the point is, is that if you tell me it is not binding, because if Ghanaians accepted it like we accepted the Constitution, then we would have been going by it. And each government would do bits of it until the 40th year would see that uh, uh, Judanso's government has done this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your government has done this, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. But are you hopeful that government will be able to end this year and end the IMF relationship they this should. year? They should. And I think if I look at the figures, um, there are problems. Mm. I think uh, some of the social interventions are taking a lot on government shoulders. Uh, but if, if they should go by the stringent measures they have set themselves, uh, I think I want to believe the Minister of uh, Finance, uh, and I believe the President is very sincere about what he wants to do also. So I think we should get, in fact, whether we can or not, I think we should. So that we should be able to get out of the clashes of the IMF. You are not open to an, ex an extension, maybe to April, the first quarter of the well, next year. Well, if if there is the inevitability of extension, what mm -hmm. what can one do? Uh, if if we should extend it and for a good cause, then we should. Other than that, I don't see why we shouldn't uh, make sure that we end this. And therefore, government has a policy space to be able to now roll out its own programs. There's a question that's been asked: Which country has been developed by the IMF before? Not a single one. And that's because? And that is because there is no policy space for the governments in power. I they see. tell you where to go. And they tell you to do what America would have done, what Britain would have done, even though it's like one size fits all kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right? It's like headache. The moment that Joseph Stiglitz had, he worked with them. Yeah. And later on, he saw the light and he's now writing the good articles. <laughs> now writing the good now articles. Good articles <laughs> and good books. Interesting. And, and good books. He says it is like... It is like um, aspirin mm -hmm. to cure uh, aches. Every that, type of ache. Every type of ache. Toothache, they say, go and take aspirin. Uh, Thermocate, take aspirin. Every, but if you watch out, the good doctor will tell you that if you have ulcer, you can't take aspirin. Mm -hmm. So this one size fits all kind of thing for all developing countries. Hippic, go hippic, go structure adjustment, liberalize, uh, privatize. You know, that one size fits all, for example, that's not fit. And then the stringent, the, 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 the arrogance of the IMF, and then they being so stringent. So you are unable to fulfill what you want to fulfill because of the stringent measures. And yet, and yet, we say they should be. You know, and that is what the BRICS have found out. Mm -hmm. They found out that global development is suffering because the structures we put in place in 1947 the Bretton Woods structure, yeah, yeah. is failing the world. All trade now, for example, is denominated in dollars. Yeah. So every country is supporting the dollar and building a dollar country. That's the US. So whether you like it or not, the structure of the IMF, which is built for what? Policing world finances, will be tailored towards the dollar countries. Yeah. Or the dollar countries. So the BRICS want to have their own bank, 
which will make nonsense of the World Bank and the IMF, if third world countries support it. Now, they want to have a currency or trade system which is not support or uh, built or pivoted by the dollar. It's going slowly. It's difficult. For those who do not know the BRICS, it's Brazil, oh, Bra Brazil Russia, Russia, India, India China, 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 and uh, South, of, South okay. Africa. Wonderful. Yes. So, yes. so these are the countries who the are, are pushing their alternative exactly, system alternative to the IMF. System. In this and which, which I support strongly. But they I mean, want to roll out a $500 billion, $500 billion dollar bank. Why we still go to the IMF is surprising. Mindful of our difficulties with our structural adjustment programs, yes. mindful of our problems with even PAMS card, we yes. sought to do social yes. mitigation. Yes. There's history suggests that we've not been very wonderful sure. people with IMF. Yet, it's always our backstop. Where else would you have gone? <laughs> and that's why they are afraid that the Chinese are trying to make those things. That, that's interesting. Where else would you have gone? Mm. Yeah. There is one rich man in your, mm. your, your village, right? Very rich. Yeah. Uh, everybody goes there. Uh, you go there and uh, things don't work well. You are always going back so because you have a deficit. Mm. You're always going, you have to pay him. You have got to make sure that you pay him. And the old one, the loan you got uh, didn't work well. So he gives you instructions as to how to work and come and pay him. Yeah. And there's no other rich and man around. You are in a cyclical relationship exactly. with this particular <laughs> rich man. Yeah. So before we even both out China, the president mentioned the 50 billion century bond. Yes. Is this something that you support? Already there's a position towards saying that you cannot tie the next generation or two more generations to a bond when you do not know the circumstances under which it would operate then in the nearest future. There are two ways of answering this question. In the first place, yes, you can support it. Why? Because such bonds help in serious development. So it is for the generation upon generation to be able to, to sustain the bond for which we'll be able to pay. Okay. Knowing very well that this is what our grandfather's date or forefather's date in order to sustain this platform for us to grow. So in that sense, it's, a, it's something to be supported. On the other hand, uh, who can speculate the future all the time and say that because of that, let, let's not go for it? Okay. Our generation has been tied down by the mistakes and the positives of the, of the past. Mm -hmm. So every generation creates a platform for the next generation to be better. But if it will be better, then they come and meet something upon which they build. Okay. So personally, if you ask me, it depends on what we make of it. If it is a bond which comes back and the government spends almost everything on uh, social what called interventions, which is so popular in Africa, yeah. governments go for because loans and they please the masses by telling them, don't do anything. I'll build your schools for you. I'll build your roads. I'll build this. So always we are going for the bonds or we are going for the money only to pay debts. Come on. That one then, yes, I will not support it. But if we are... Look, you go for a loan in order to restructure your own uh, household or restructure your own firm so that you can repay, so that you can expand your firm. If that is not f f the reason for which the bond is being floated, then I, I don't think I would support it. So infrastructure development is actually the way forward in this case? Of course, certainly, certainly. And then you need the correct trade transformational leadership. The counter argument is that by the time you finish with your infrastructure development, the people for which you are building all of this would have been dead if of, there's no intervention to sustain them. Safety nets in this course, case. Of course, of course. Death comes even before you start whatever. Then death is not stoppable. Death is, does not lie on us. I mean, <laughs> if we begin to look at death, you do nothing. I so for you. me... Start the thing. You, you may even bring the idea. It will even start and you die. Somebody should continue. You know, life is a continuum. So let us not be speculative about death and speculative about what we gain from this. And it's like a friend of mine when we were in school, when they say we should bring some money for something, then he begins to calculate how many, king, um, how many king balls of KK it could have bought. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's interesting. Now, I would want to move on to whether or not we should build a cathedral. This conversation has been <coughs> big. Some of my friends, I will not cathedral poem to say that as true Africans, what we should not be doing is promoting the white man's religion, through which we have actually been colonized for a very long time, and that if you are minded about our history, our priority should not be a cathedral. The counter argument is that it's part of economic progress and that in the words of those in the committee, this is not just 
a national monument is also something that you lack in your state. And you need to make sure that you move forward with it. What do you, wh which side do you support? I support the side which understands what national development is all about. Unfortunately, governments upon government are unable to, uh, is unable to articulate their ideas to the people properly. Mm -hmm. When His Excellency Nadranqua brought a very nice idea, for example, like the Ghana Beyond Aid, yeah. it was so misconstrued, I, I, I got angry. I remember several symposia, you could see the questions that people are asking. They equated Ghana beyond aid to Ghana without, without aid. aid. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and government officials were unable to articulate this. Mm -hmm. And as I speak with you right now, maybe people still believe that Ghana beyond aid means Ghana without aid. I think that's the purpose. It will never happen in our world. lifetime or the lifetime of the generations to come. Ghana, Ghana without aid. It never happens. What is aid? Aid is everything. It can be from grant to gifts and whatnot. And at times you need some technical aid. Yeah. You know, the, the whole thing is shrouded. What it means that beyond these things that you borrow and that kind of thing, it must translate into something so okay. that you don't rely on it. But let's leave that aside. Cathedral. Again, people think cathedral means Catholic cathedral. And of course, there's some of the Christians are jubilating and uh, pontificating as if tomorrow it is a, a Catholic cathedral. Yes, three members of the committee have said this is to praise God, it's for thanksgiving, there you are. it's to make sure that, in fact, a deputy minister of religion told me that while all developed and uh, peaceful nations actually have cathedrals. Yes, so but, but we, it's not for the one. Catholics. It's not for the Christians alone. A national cathedral is a place of solemnity. And if I understand cathedral very well, then you, any activities could be held there, national. I can, I can imagine that if the, the Americans don't have Tigari there, our Tigari people could also go to the cathedral to, you know, because no, they are Ghanaians. To be clear, a member of the committee, Reverend from Pomasu, told me in this yeah. seat that that's not the purpose. No yeah. other religious grouping is allowed in that there. Is, that is the mistake, because the national cathedral is, of course, wouldn't allow Tigari to go there because they are thinking cathedral means... Uh, but look, I think somebody articulated this very well and said that it is a place where the nation, most of the things we are having at the International Conference Center, that mm. could be also be held there. Yes. Does that mean it's religious? No, but what, I mean, and I'm sourcing from two people, one on the committee, the other a deputy minister. They all seem to suggest that this is a Christian thing to promote uh, Christian worship, and also because Christians have built a lot of schools for us, at least some payback, and complimentary payback is not bad at all. Compliment to payback, and you're talking of national cathedrals are for unity. Mm -hmm and not necessarily for one church. So which of the churches can go there and which cannot go there? So, oh, can, can so Obini, far Christian can go there. So can Obini go there? I have not queried that There yet. you are. Then you will see people protesting. Yeah. Can uh, Uzu Bempa go there? You see other people protesting, isn't it? Yeah. Can, you know, all, can Kwaku Sam go there? He, so, he also go to the Bible. I certainly know it's not there you the are, case. There you are. So we don't have to start discriminating. It is a national Cathedral, they check the meaning of a cathedral. It's not Catholic. We were building cathedrals, mm -hmm. all right? And that is the Catholics building cathedrals, and that's what they think. Maybe I'm also wrong. But my understanding of a national cathedral is a place for national unity, for national events. Hofe Boigny's cathedral did not It was serve. not a cathedral. He yes. built, he, no, no, no. He built a, um, uh, a basilica. A basilica. Or a yes. And the basilica is purely a Catholic thing. Mm -hmm. He built a replica of the of, of the Rome Basilica, mm -hmm. bigger than the Rome Basilica. He said he wanted to make it the biggest basilica in the world, which he did, mm -hmm. and it's Catholic. So the Pope, for, it was only once that the Pope came there. I see. You know, and it doesn't make sense to build a basilica in a place where the Catholic population is less than the other. <laughs> <you know. laughs> so ours is not a basilica type. If my, I may be wrong, I, I, I stand to be corrected. I but you. my understanding was that we are building a national cathedral for national unity, national purpose. It should must serve a national purpose. That, that, that is my understanding. But if it is for the Catholics, then I'm a Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, they say that every Christian can actually use but the place. But then we will be fighting among ourselves, L which Christian? Because I don't respect some of the Christian churches in Ghana. You don't? I don't, and I will really? never. Yes, I will mention it. They know themselves. That there's nothing you, you Christianity. You discriminate when it comes to I will discriminate. Because I don't see where Whenever uh, Jesus Christ 
sat down and collected consultation fees. So those churches who collect consultation fees are not Christian churches. I don't believe that. I never saw in the Bible where they should uh, ask people to send money through mobile phones for prayers to be held for them. I don't suffer. That's don't, modern Christianity. Probably you are not in tune modern Christianity, the, which yes, has not the orthodox camp. But, but well, our, our whole Christianity is pivoted on the Bible. Yes. But the Bible I have has no place for those things. It also depends on the interpretation of the Bible in this case. Well, what what, the spirit, what the Spirit leads you to think of what the text says. Oh, so the Spirit leads people to, to give lotto numbers? Yes, but... Well, well, that's what they do. I'm sure you know that. Well, I, I, I may have to <laughs> pretty soon, but there's a, there's a problem with the location of this cathedral. Yes. That yes. problem. Yes. Do you think it's a problem too? Yes, it's a problem. Moving let's let's subject with... let's subject the whole thing to national debate. Everywhere in the world, uh, a lot uh, of infrastructure uh, uh, demolished in order to put something else there. Everywhere in the world. And so, if it is the Ghanaian, let's debate it. Let's debate it uh, peacefully. And not an, in any antagonism because it's a national cathedral. I would have wished. You see, some of the mistakes we make in this world. You know, the aviation, aviation uh, uh, plot or aviation, uh, civil aviation had some large acreage of land. Yes, around the airport. No, 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 no. They, they, it's uh, in Medina. Okay. It's big. Okay. We gave them to the we gave to the Chinese. The Chinese were being given some some uh, some land near the. Uh, atomic energy, and the professor got up and, uh, you know, the professor was arrested, and then we, yes. as soon as we moved the Chinese away from there, we gave them that huge, very more lucrative place. That is the place the cathedral could have been housed. Very, it's huge, bigger, twice bigger than where we are now look, looking for and going to destroy this thing. So these are some of the things governments must watch. Okay. We, we shouldn't be that quick and greedy, locating this uh, to, to foreigners, so that we get some pottery, some and that sort of thing. That place would have been the best place without destroying anything. I want us to run up, and I know that you are very passionate about corruption and how we should fight it as a continent, and more importantly in Ghana here. Are we fighting corruption the way you think we should fight it? I don't think we are there yet, but mm. we've started something. I think the inception of uh, Amidu's outfit yeah. uh, is in the right direction. Uh, Anas is doing very well, and now everybody is sensing that corruption is not good. Everybody is sitting on ten toes. It's good. But we need to go further. I tell you, corruption is still there because of, not just because of poverty, people are saying, but because of our national psyche, that if you know something, to, somebody has a regular sex, and yeah. he calls me to see if, if I can help uh, the daughter go to Legon. Why? But you're automatically qualified for sex. <laughs> and, and, and this one, if you ask her to bring about some 5,000, so that I can go and give it to mm -hmm. the vice chancellor. Let me just bring the 5,000. I see. You know, so our national psyche must change. Mm -hmm. Number two, indiscipline okay. must also change. If we don't drive away these two things, forget about forget about. Uh, I'm very appreciative of our time today. I'm so sure we should do more of it. Thank anytime, you so much. Anytime. Dr. Vladimir Chinasu is a colossus, bio standards and qualifications. Folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront.